Mic check, one, two, one, two. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jamal Landris, and this is Turntables to Trendsetters, a Scripps News special dedicated to hip hop's 50th anniversary. <laughs> We ain't here to make friends, we got a job to do. Don't matter who you are, you still got something to prove. When them lights come on and you hear that crowd. It's a sound and style like no other. Born in the Bronx, New York, hip hop celebrates its golden anniversary this year. It's been 50 years since DJ Cool Herc spun the beats that would take the world by storm. But hip hop isn't just about music, it's a culture, a way of life that's influenced aspects of millions of lives from slang on the street to billion dollar retail brands. Hip hop's birth was simple. It was an escape from poverty and violence in the Bronx. And over the last 50 years, Rap and hip-hop have grown into the number one music genre in the U.S. with nearly a third of the market and one of the most popular music genres in the world. Over the next hour, we'll explore its evolution, celebrate its legacy, and address whether it needs to change. But first, let's hit rewind. Our Christian Bryant gives us a little history lesson on how we got here. 50 years ago, during a neighborhood party in the Bronx, a multi-billion dollar musical genre was born out of a break in the music. Born in Jamaica and raised in the Bronx, 18-year-old Clive Campbell, better known as DJ Cool Herc, used a turntable to extend the musical breaks of records for more dancing, speaking over the beat in the Jamaican musical style of toasting. That music, with its focus on a steady beat, break dancing, and improvisational wordplay, became hip hop. Something that was like a new genre coming in the, you know, the early 80s is now a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, I, I never thought I'd become famous. It just became um, another passion of mine. After DJ Cool Herc set in the Bronx, the hip-hop sound spread throughout New York and soon made its way to Inglewood, New Jersey, the home to Sugar Hill Records and the Sugar Hill Gang. In 1979, they released Rapper's Delight, what is widely considered to be the first mainstream hip-hop hit. Here's Wonder Mike, Hank, and Master G. It is totally, without question, one of the greatest feelings in the world to create something that not only you thought was good, but the entire galaxy, literally. Rapper's Delight was added to the National Recording Registry by the Library of Congress in 2011, and it was hailed as a pioneer. Not that it was the first rap song released, but it was one of a kind especially during a time when record labels were still unsure of the marketability of the rising genre. We tour all over the world. We work feverishly daily on a regular basis, and it's a direct result of what's happened as a result of what Mike Hank and I did. As the genre grew, so too did its political leanings. Songs like The Message by Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Changes by Tupac Shakur, and Fight the Power from Public Enemy were anthems against poverty, oppression, and police brutality. In 2008, civil rights leader Al Sharpton said, I didn't come out of the We Shall Overcome generation, I came out of Fight the Power, Public Enemy. The popularity of hip hop today, both the music and the culture surrounding it, is almost incalculable. But we'll throw some numbers at you to give you an idea of its scale. R&B and hip hop accounted for nearly 29% of on-demand music streams in 2022, making it the top stream genre of the year, according to entertainment data from Luminate. The five wealthiest artists in hip hop were worth nearly $4 billion together in 2022, and their financial successes show the influence of hip hop culture beyond the music. Sponsorships and partnerships with luxury fashion labels, shoe brands, cannabis enterprises, and technology. What was once a pariah in the music industry became the genre du jour for major companies. There are young artists, young, you know, entrepreneurs in the hip hop industry who are building generational wealth. As artists today build on the capital and cultural successes of hip hop, many also remember its humble origins. We felt forgotten. We felt like we were our own world where we just had to fend for ourselves and we did fend for ourselves. It saved my life and the lives of many others, created a platform, created a, a instrument, a tool, a mechanism for people who live in dire circumstances to change the standard of living for themselves and their families for generations. Christian Bryant, Scripps News.
Thank you to Christian Bryant. This celebration of hip hop requires a whole group of people. So let me introduce you to our panel. First and foremost, we have Dr. Lakita Bennett Bailey here with us. Thank you so much for being here. An associate professor at Georgia State University. Her classes and research interests include pop culture, hip hop, black women, and politics. Thank you again for Thank coming you. by. We also have hip hop royalty here. Councilman Dupree Kelly, who represents his hometown of Newark, New Jersey's West Ward. He's also a founding member of platinum hip-hop artist Lords of the Underground, award-winning artist and multi-platinum super producer, Bangladesh. He's produced hits for it, and this is a long list, so give me a minute. So Wayne, Gucci Mane, Ludacris, Nicki Minaj, Jadakiss, Meek Mill, T.I., 2 Chainz, Missy Elliott, Beyonce, Rihanna, and a whole lot more. I want to particularly thank you for that Word of Mouth album. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Dr. A.D. Carson, professor, professor of hip-hop in the Global South at the University of Virginia, and Professor Timothy Welbeck, director of the Center for Anti-Racism at Temple University. His areas of expertise include hip-hop and black culture. So, let's get into it, everybody. Thanks for being here. Hip-hop has come a long way since 1973. The sound, the style are ingrained in so many layers of our lives and cultures now. Let's start with Councilman Dupree. How have you seen hip-hop grow and evolve? Again, you are hip-hop royalty, after all. <laughs> Oh, man, thank you. I mean, it's, it's grown so many ways. You know, um, when you when you talk about the elements just of hip-hop, first of all, I just want to say what's up to the rest of the uh, panel. Um, but when you talk about hip-hop, when you talk about its elements um, from b-boying, b-boying, you know, b-boying and b-girling was, they were the dancers back in the days. And the dancers, they were fashionable. They always wore the fly gear because they wanted you to, when they danced, they wanted to, you to see see them wearing the fly fits. Now that has turned into a billion dollar industry when you talk about fashion coming from hip hop. Um, when you're just talking about uh, art, the graffiti. Graffiti has turned in, you know, has just set, just set the standard around the world in, in many art museums and it's become a billion, billion dollar industry so hip hop has spawned so many things out of the elements of hip hop, from MCing to now people are making millions of dollars off of podcasts and television shows and acting. So just taking a, a, a DJ and two MCs and a, a DJ and an MC and putting them in front of a microphone has spawned this this big culture into a multi-billion dollar industry. So. I look forward to the next 50 years of its growth. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to go over to Bangladesh now. According to Luminate's 22-year-in report, Gen Z is becoming a more powerful influence on the market with their consumption habits. They spend more time every week listening to music than any other generation. It's so much easier for them. They discover music on streaming services and apps like Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and especially TikTok. Uh, what impact has this had on hip hop? You know, that this this TikTok generation took Lil Nas X from his living room to the Grammys. So talk a little bit about that change. I think it's a good and a bad thing. You know, um, it's great for people to have uh, control of their own career instead of like, uh, you know, waiting for somebody to give them permission to come through the, through the door, you know. So it's, it's a great uh, from, it was great from being in your living room and you connecting with the whole world. You know, it's, it's way different than uh, the times when I was starting out. You know, it was more, I uh, think it was a little more difficult. You know, you had to prove yourself a little more, which is kind of a good thing. It's like artist development. I think that's what's missing today is artist development because a lot of times, like, you know, the new age uh, artists, they're not being developed. So the longevity is not the same, you know. Uh, it's kind of a quick burn. And it's, the consumer's on to the next artist. Uh, before it was like, you had artist development, so the artist stuck around, you know, like Usher. Like Usher was young when he, you know, came in the game. He's still, he's still relevant because he went through artist development. You know, uh, Chris Brown, 
I mean, a lot of artists that, you know, uh, came before the new generation and kind of still around. And we seeing a lot of the new generation, they kind of come and go real quick. But I think it's like a good thing that we don't have to, we don't have to like wait for people to control our, I mean, to have control of our own careers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's um really quickly before we get out of here, I have one last question for mm -hmm. Dr. Welbeck. Give me as quick as you can a little bit about um, the mental health discussion that goes on in hip hop now. Talk a little bit about the change that has happened and how big of a deal that is now. As with anything, hip hop gives a lens into the lives of the of, of, the, of its creators and the communities from which it derives. And so, as mental health becomes a greater priority, and as we become even more attuned to various aspects of mental health, you begin to see artists embrace that more. And so. We've absolutely seen that within the last decade, artists talking about their mental health, but it's not necessarily something that's new. We've seen artists almost from the inception talking about it, whether you're looking at the message, Psycho Jungle sometimes it makes you wonder how I keep from going under, like Melly Mel was talking about that in 1982. Scarface was talking about my mind's playing tricks on me. And so we've seen hip hop demonstrate an ability to discuss mental health nearly from the outset and now we just see a greater propensity for artists to do that and greater liberties as it's happening absolutely we've got plenty more coming up next we take this conversation to the c-suite and examine what seems to be a lack of diversity behind the music stick with us Hip-hop is multi-layered, and it influences multiple layers of our lives. But when you hit pause and look at the industry behind the music, those diverse layers don't go very deep. Here's what I mean. For many people living in the States, hip-hop is synonymous with black culture and is perceived to feed stereotypes about black people and the over-sexualization of women, especially black women. When we looked at some numbers, those groups were represented the least in the C-suite. In 2021, the Annenberg Inclusion Initiative at the University of Southern California studied diversity in the music business across positions of power. It focused on underrepresented ethnic and racial groups, gender, and blacks. Researchers examined the rank and titles of 4,060 executives at 119 companies. Of the executives, VP level and above, only 7.5% are black, and only 3% are black women. 70 major and independent companies were examined for their top executives, CEO, chairman, and president. 86.1% of those executives were men, and just 10, or less than 14%, were women. And 86.1% of top execs were white. I want to welcome back our prestigious panel here and go straight to Dr. Bennett Bailey. When you see those numbers, what do they say to you? I think they say a couple of things. Um, and first, I think they say that there is still a lack of diversity in hip hop and that there are other people that can control the images that we see um, being put forth in hip hop on the one hand. So we can look at, for example, the fumble that happened with Capitol Records earlier this year with um, signing uh, of uh, AI rapper, right? So FN Mecca is a rapper they right. signed, right? And they immediately had to go back and change that and, and unsign him um, because people were, were protesting against it. Yep. And so it shows, again, what the lack of diversity has because they had someone in the boardroom that could tell them, no, this probably is not the right thing to do, <laughs> right. then that would have been great. On the other hand, however, um, with some of the statistics you showed before, is that I think a lot more people are using streaming, internet, mm -hmm. and web services. And so I think people are are coming into hip hop in a different way. Um, and so some of these record labels may eventually become obsolete and some of this kind of control over it may become obsolete because younger people are using streaming. They're using the internet. They're not going necessarily to their radio station to hear music. They are going to their computer. Um, they're going to their streaming services. So I think that there is, again, still some ways in which you want to come into mm -hmm. um, hip hop and think about hip hop and there is still some control. But I think younger people are thinking of a way to get outside yeah. of the control of the industry. Yeah. yeah. You know, those gatekeepers, I think, are really important and, and the lack of them now, mm -hmm. right? 
Councilman Kelly, according to this study, there's a lack of diversity in the C-suite. I'm wondering about the impact on music. You know, there's always been this strain from the record label to the artist. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, the strain from the record label to the artist has been there for, for years. And uh, like Bangladesh spoke about earlier, I think that is, it's made a little more easier when you have the ability to control uh, the narrative a little bit by putting out your own music, going directly to the consumer instead of dealing with the middleman, even though we, we now consider uh, the DSPs to be the middleman, you know, and uh, the online services to be the middleman. But it's a little easier than when I came out, you know, Lords of the Underground, we signed in 1991. Uh, to the WIA system and then went on to the EMI system. And it was difficult because then we were also signed to a production deal with Marley Marl. Mm. So, you know, uh, we have always a middleman before we can get up to that C-suite and talk directly to, to, the, uh, to the people who are in charge. And now we become, and when I say we, the artists actually can become the executives by dealing with it, you know, directly. Yeah, yeah. Let's move on. Up next, we have how hip-hop grew from a block party in the Bronx to billion-dollar business deals. We'll be right back. Hip-hop is a multi-billion dollar industry. Experts say its impact on the music world and beyond is so widespread, it's difficult to put a number on it. Its reach stretches beyond the lyrics and beats and push many artists above the music. Jay-Z, with all of his business ventures like Rock Nation and Rock Nation Sports, is worth $2.5 billion. Ye was worth $2 billion until he lost his deal with Adidas last year. That number is now $400 million. Diddy is worth a billion. When you add up his business deals, including Deleon, Tequila, Revolt, and his music label, Bad Boy Records. Dr. Dre pocketed over $3 billion when he sold Beats by Dre, and now has a net worth of $400 million. In Drake's deals with Nike, Sprite, and Universal Music Group makes him worth a quarter of a billion dollars, and his net worth is expected to climb. It's a lot of zeros. Let's welcome back my guests. Welcome back to you at home. Here are two more examples before we move on. Run DMC turned a song about their Adidas into a seven-figure endorsement deal with the Shoemaker. I'm sure Nelly is waiting on his similar deal. 50 Cent partnered with Vitamin Water and earned not just cash, but an equity stake. Let's go to Dr. Carson. Talk to me about hip hop break, how hip hop broke down barriers for artists to enter those other industries. Um, well, thank you so much and peace to the other panelists. And I also wanna give a shout out to Cindy Campbell and the pre-1973 mm -hmm. progenitors to what we understand hip hop to be. Um, and I think that well, my response to, to the question about like hip hop breaking down barriers is probably something that's a little more, well, not so much focused on the, the money that hip hop has made for people, but the kind of cultural influence. Mm. Um, myself and I imagine that everybody else who's on this panel like could not have our livelihoods mm. without hip hop. And I don't think that that is the aspiration to become a billionaire. And truth told, I'm not that enamored with billionaires as my, nor, uh, you know, my North Star. And I think that when we're having this conversation about what trend setting is and what it means for a culture to achieve success, I hope that we don't narrowly define it as just making money. Uh, because if we do that, then I think that what we're doing is aligning ourselves with the conditions that produced hip hop out of perceived lack, out of neglect. Um, and it also maybe gives us the false impression that the only ways that we can demonstrate success in this world is through making money and or buying in or selling out to um, the conditions that created the very thing that we are celebrating here after 50 plus years. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. The idea of this consumerism and capitalism is sort of taken over and always been a part of hip hop, I believe. To that end, Bangladesh, I want to ask you, you know, Jay-Z just had that line about how many billionaires come from Hove's crib, right? 
What does all of this tell you about hip hop's influence sort of beyond the mic and how you feel about the money that is being made here? Um, you know, without hip hop, you know, I don't know what I would be doing. You know, hip hop changed my life. So, you know, it provided, you know, a living for my family. Um, but, you know, like like the gentleman before me speaking said, you know, like it's really what you're doing with the money. You know, it's like I've seen a lot of individual uh, success, but, you know, I think the whole ultimate goal for when hip hop was created was to like uplift the culture in a sense. You know what I'm saying? So I think when you when you start making all those zeros and billions and, you know, it's, it's self-satisfaction in that. But, you know. I don't think uh, we're doing enough as a as a culture, a community, as a as, uh, brotherhood, and you know, uh, entrepreneurship. You know, I think we need to make our dollars make sense for like the bigger picture. You know, yep. so we're not yep. always uh, second in line, third in line, and bottom of the totem pole. You know, we can really ch make yeah. some changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, with with you know. <laughs> All these zeros, you know, yeah. it's cool. Like, oh, he's a billionaire. Or, oh, you got 400 million. Uh, that's cool. I was never like, that was I mean, never my my goal, you know, to like be a billionaire or, you know, multimillionaire. It's cool. But I would have, you know, it's more about the purpose of it. You know? Absolutely. Let me let me get, get out of here and pay some bills, Bangladesh. We have plenty more after the break. We've all heard the saying, art imitates life. But is it now the other way around in hip hop? That's coming up next. Welcome back. This is Turntables to Trendsetters, a Scripps News special celebrating 50 years of hip hop. I'm Jamal Andrus. Born in 1973, hip hop danced on the heels of the civil rights movement. but. This musical baby wasn't supposed to grow up. It fought to survive and despite the doubters, grew into its own cultural movement, telling the stories of racial injustice, police brutality and poverty, since the country still had not overcome with it. The beats and lyrics carried an attitude. Jason Parham, a writer for Wired, described it like this. Hip hop represented you, and in turn, you represented it back. So you rebelled, you shouted, F the police. You asked, can I kick it? Their stories were your stories. Hip hop was where you found more of yourself, where you forged confidence. Let's dig into this a bit. Dr. Bennett Bailey again here with us. Many hip hop artists have moved away from the roots of the genre, calling out injustices in our communities over the years. Some say the music has become more aggressive, weaving stories of murder and even rape. Rick Ross, you don't even know, comes to mind about slipping a pill in a woman's drink. It's often focused on guns, drugs, and sex. So if Jason Parham is right when he wrote, hip hop represented you and in turn you represented it back, is art imitating life or is life imitating art when it comes to hip hop today? So a couple of things with that. One is to think about hip hop as not as this monolithic genre, right? And so to think about that there are these different subgenres of rap that exist. And so I would argue that hip hop does still talk about some of the social injustices in society. Most of my research is on that, how hip hop talks about social injustices in society. But I will also make the argument that hip hop is still representing or, or reflecting what is going on in society. Mm -hmm. And one thing we have to think about is American society. What is going on in American society? And violence has long been a part of American society. Misogyny has long been a part of American society. And hip hop is still talking about those things, but also reflecting the information that they have present in American society. So it is still um, art imitating life. It's still a reflection of what people are are experiencing as in American society yeah. as Americans. And so I think hip hop still has that idea of talking about things that are going on. And it, what it does actually is it brings us more awareness mm -hmm. of things that are not being discussed on mainstream, in the mainstream media. So when you're thinking about Rick Ross, you know, this was something that was occurring to women. Mm -hmm. And now he's talking about it, which then brought awareness, because now people are talking about what he said in his song. And yeah. is this now an issue or something we need to do to help 
protect women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when I think about that reflection and that storytelling, <laughs> Ice Cube's Today Was a Good Day often comes to mind. I want to bring in Councilman Kelly. Uh, here's legendary MC Chuck D talking about violence and hip-hop during an interview with TMZ. I want your thoughts on the other side. Listen. You have people who have grown up in this thinking that a hip-hop death is a normal thing where it was so odd and unique, whether it was from old age or young age in the 80s and 90s. But this has been going on for so long, the access of guns, the access of drugs, and then the fact of, a, of the people say, yeah, oh yeah, I've heard it in my rap songs. It started out as a reflection to take on and address, mm -hmm. to stop the violence, to, to, to not go into the realm of self-destruction. Yeah, yeah, Councilman Kelly, give me your reaction to Chuck D's words there. I mean, I think he's right, you know, um, and, and I'm, I believe the doctor is right, too. You know, the way that I learned the hip hop was you talked about how you lived your life. And because hip hop has become this, this, you know, world love, loved art, the people who are doing the hip hop are speaking about hip hop, how they live their life. How their, how their lives are lived around other things that they talk about, what's going on in society. So the doc is right, depending on where you're from. If you're in America, if you're in France, if you're in a neighborhood that is uh, riddled with poverty and, and gang violence, if you're um, there too and you're trying to stop it and you're talking about our social injustice with police or our social ills, all of those things are gonna come out in the most popular music and the pop music right now is the hip hop culture music rap music so then you're going to get a vast majority of things that are talked about worldwide the problem is that the avenues the major uh places to put out music the major companies are really only putting out the things that sell uh and that happens to be a lot of negative undertones to it uh, like the doctor said, there's so many different other genres of uh, subgenres of hip hop that talk about great things, but it doesn't connect to the masses as much as being violent, if if or being negative. If you even look on, just take social media for example. If you're on social media and we put something nice posted on social media saying that we help these people or we walk the lady across the street. It's gonna get probably minimal views. But if I put something negative up there, if I put, look what just happened in my neighborhood, a shooting or this guy smacked this girl or this fight, it's gonna get millions of views. And the record companies look at it the same way, in my opinion, that the the harsh realities, the, the negativity, the shock value, yeah. that is more exciting to watch than oh, this is nice, this is sweet, this right. is something positive, unless you shock them with the, the, the things that are positive in a way that makes them attracted to it. Yeah, yeah, I wanna, I wanna bring Dr. Welbeck in here. You know, we've lost so many. Um, Young Dolph, Pop Smoke, Offset most recently, King Von out of Chicago. Um, some say hip hop is a scapegoat for violence in this country. I'm wondering, considering the violence we've seen and that thought process, what are your considerations when you think about both of those things? I think that is a complicated narrative. In many ways, people like the rappers that you named are talking about the conditions from which they lived in, and they're coming from communities that are devastated by violence. But I think the broader discussion should also be the conditions that created these types of communities and led to the types of conditions that they were living in. The deprivation, the, the um, lack of investment, the defunding of schools, the lack of viable opportunities for employment, these types of things lead to the types of dire straits that people find themselves in. If you put people in desperate situations, they will do desperate things to survive. And so ultimately, it is a great travesty when we've lost so many of these rappers, particularly to violence. And so many of these things are preventable. These, these artists that you've just paraded across the screen are great examples of them. I wished that each of them could have lived to see old age. We, I, you know, we wanted to see gray hair and takeoffs and locks, for example. But, Despite that, I think that 
we have to both hold artists accountable when they make music that we find objectionable, but we also need to object to the conditions that create this type of circumstances that many of these artists are talking about as well. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's why we're all so thankful for the, the, the standard bearers, the OGs that we have in hip hop now. Let me move forward to this. A question for the audience. Are women the future of hip hop? Some, many even say yes. We'll see what my guests say when we come back. Straight into a lyrical freestyle. Grab the mic, look at the crowd and see smiles. Cause they see a woman standing up on her own too. Sloppy slouching is something I won't do. Some think that we can't flow. Can't flow. Stereotypes, they got to go. Got to go. I'ma mess around and flip the scene into revert. With what? With a little touch of ladies first. Queen Latifah's anthem to feminism and women's empowerment, Ladies First, was released in 1989. It highlighted sexism and hip-hop in the 80s. Though ladies have always been in the forefront of the music, they haven't always been acknowledged and treated the same as their male counterparts. But that may not be the case anymore. From light as a rock to bodak yellow, women in hip-hop have influenced the sound and moved the genre forward. I don't dance now, I make money moves. But as fans look around today, it's hard to miss the outsized impact women are having on the rap game. This is something that we've been desperately waiting for. I spoke with three black women who cover the hip-hop industry about the pendulum swing they say is undeniable. This younger generation is is growing up in a music world where women are at the forefront. Compare that to a time when female rappers often needed a cosign from an MC or a crew. What up, boo? Just keep me laced in the illa snakes, baby. From Foxy Brown to Eve to Trina to Little Kim, women in rap were often billed as the first lady in order to break into the industry. Eve's debut album is literally titled, you know, Eve First Lady. It is acknowledging how dope that you know, like these women are lyrically, but it's also saying, well, they're dope because they were kind of one of the guys or like they're dope enough to be in my crew that's full of guys. But as social media removes some of the gatekeepers of the music industry, more female rappers have found their way to the mainstream. I think one of the things I'm excited about with this new generation of women is that they are resourceful. <laughs> Cardi B was like really, really capitalizing on TikTok and using that a lot. Um, Doja Cat was using that as a way to engage with her fans and her audience. So were people like Sweetie. You're able to really showcase that talent on these social mediums and even engage with them so that they feel like they know you not only as a rapper, but as a person also. In 2020, five different female rappers hit number one on the Billboard Top 100. Doja Cat and Nicki Minaj's Say So remix became the first song by two female rappers to ever reach number one. And they're not done. I really love where hip hop is as far as like the women kind of almost being on an equal like playing field as the men. These women are taking the pressure off of them themselves and really having fun with it. You have women sort of at every level you know, having some sort of like presence recognition. It's just going to keep going as we move towards the future of hip hop. My guests are back and I, I, I do think women are having all the fun. Dr. Manette Bailey, one of the things Clover Hope, who we heard from in the piece, writes about is whenever an article was written or a story was told about women in rap, male dominated genre was sure to be somewhere close behind. My question for you, for you is, is that still true today? Um, yes, hip hop is still very much a male dominated genre. Um, but I think what we were seeing in the package before is that there are a lot of women who are using technology to insert themselves um, for inclusion into hip hop. And I think one thing that we're seeing is women are having more control over their careers and building a team of other women to help them. And it was something, it was some barriers that they had to go through in order to have that support. Um, but we are seeing more women break out and again, use technology. I mean, I think Instagram, um, Twitter, TikTok, mm -hmm. all of those are big platforms for women to break into um, the mainstream and to be a part of the mainstream and to have their voices heard. Um, within the mainstream. Yeah, yeah, I want to bring in Dr. Carson quickly. 
Earlier this month, a New York Times article declared the future of hip hop is female. Flo Millie in that article shared, quote, girls are just blowing up now because we're putting more energy into the bars. We're not on that killing ish that they used to be so obsessed about. At the end of the day, nobody's trying to be living like that forever. Do you agree? Are women the future of hip hop? Um, I believe that women are the past, present, and future of hip hop. And I think that we probably have to do better histories whenever we're talking about these things so that, you know, anytime we tell the story about, about Cool Hurt Clive Campbell, then we probably should include that Cindy Campbell threw the party. Whenever yes. we talk about the Sugar Hill, whenever we talk about the Sugar Hill Gang, then we probably should talk about the fact that Sylvia Robinson is one of the first, if not, well, the first hip hop mogul, the inventor of the commercial rap record. Uh, we should also talk about uh, the group that she signed the sequence um, to uh, yeah. Sugar Hill Records, you know, not only is it an all women, uh, an all woman hip hop group? It's Southern women, and um, and their influence is heard as recently as Uptown Funk, which I believe they are listed as uh, writers on because it samples that first mm -hmm. record that they had. And so I think that certainly one of the ways that we might think about the influence of women is charting, you know, in Billboard or getting Grammys or all of these sort of capitalistic measures. But some of the other cultural measures are like simply being there in the room. I don't know that you can watch any hip hop film um, from the beginning stages without seeing women very present. I don't know that we have ruthless records, you know, like the, the, the prominence of that record company without um, a group like JJ Thad. So, um, yeah, it's just my my opinion is that the ways that we do our histories and the ways that we talk presently should be better researched so that we can talk about the people who were actually there so we don't make the mistake of acting like folk just showed up right. um, because those people are now visible to us because yep. that's also a history of black women in this country. That's a history of black people in this country. People don't believe that we showed up until folks started exploiting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know, it sounds a lot like the criticism that the civil rights movement often gets, putting these men toward the front and women toward the back and ignoring their contribution. contribution. Let's pay some bills really quick, but before we do, the big question, does hip hop need to change? My guests share their thoughts on the other side next. From Run DMC's collab with Aerosmith in 1986 to remake the rock band's 70s hit Walk This Way. Nas X and Billy Ray Cyrus teaming up for Old Town Road in 2019. Despite roots in black culture, hip hop has grown. It transcends race, class, gender, and every social category. Hip hop crosses cultural barriers and fashion lines. Fans around the world have adopted it as a form of expression and identity. So it's been a great hour, but we have come to our final thoughts. After all we've discussed, I want Bangladesh, I want to ask you first, and we want to get around the group here, so keep your answer around 30 seconds or less if you can. But for everyone, does hip hop need to change and return to its roots? Bangladesh, I'll start with you first. Absolutely. I think we lost control of hip hop. You know, I think it's too much like sexual sexuality being shown too many guns to, you know, we need to think more about the kids. Like when I was growing up, I learned like real lessons from hip hop, you know what I'm saying? So I could imagine what the youth is learning now based on like what the women are saying, what the, the, youth, the new Gen Z is saying, you know, it's really not reflecting what real hip hop is. Yeah, yeah. Councilman Kelly, can I have you come in here next? Oh, uh, man, I, I just say that, yes, you know, with growth comes change. And I think with any uh, platform 
especially when it's, it has a celebrity attached to it um, or notoriety attached to it, we have to be held accountable. And I think that, that the artists, even though you're creating art, even though that you're speaking freely and creating freely, I think that you have to be held accountable because Run DMC didn't tell me to take the shoestrings out of my sneakers. They just did and they look fly doing it, so I wanted to do it. So if uh, Drake is doing something that looks fly but is, but is not considered right, or if any artist is doing something that has popularity, that is doing something that is not considered uh, something positive and considered something negative, then you're going to have the youth try to follow that. So I think that it must change mm-hmm. and it must be, uh, you know, they, they must realize that we have to be held accountable because we have the babies, we have the youth, we have our community, yeah. we have society with all eyes on us, as Pac said. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Welbeck, give me your thoughts. I would say that it's incumbent upon the elders within hip hop to just nurture this younger generation and remind them that these young people created a culture that changed the world and fundamentally altered how we look at language, music, fashion, culture, and the like. And in terms of whether hip hop needs to change just in a broader sense, there are people who are doing things that we love and we need to be better about amplifying them and amplifying the voices that are courageous, that are having the challenging conversations that are creating dynamic art. But what's at the forefront, the mainstream iteration of the culture, that's in the hands of the corporate C-suites as we talked about earlier. Mm. And we need to do what we can to grapple the culture back from them. But ultimately, what we have that's worth celebrating, we should celebrate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, last minute here, Dr. Bennett Bailey. How about you take a swing at it? Um, I will have to disagree. I don't. I don't think hip hop needs to change. I think we need to again reiterate the idea that from its founding, hip hop has been a culture of subgenres, um, and specifically rap music. But they've been a culture um, of subgenres within the within the industry. And I don't think they d- necessarily need to change. I think we're seeing hip hop grow, yeah. right? And with that growth comes change, and we're becoming this global phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And when I say we, I mean hip hop. Um, <laughs> become this global phenomenon. And so you are seeing other cultures embrace hip hop mm-hmm. and take some of those subgenres to talk about issues in their own community. Mm-hmm. So I don't think we need to revert back to anything. I think we need to nurture what is currently mm-hmm. growing growing out of hip-hop. Absolutely, absolutely. And Dr. Carson, I'll leave you with the last word, sir. Well, I think that um, there probably needs to be a a broader... I mean, I believe that the United States needs to change. And I think if the United States changes, then the productions that come from the United States change. And I think that that's something that hip-hop has been about since the very beginning. But I should also say that we are in a country that is rooted in criminalism, so it's rich that this country might point the finger at things that are negative, but it absolutely celebrates in other contexts. So I would say you should study America's history and its present because I'd be more worried about the influence of Manifest Destiny than I ever would about the influence of Manny Fresh and Cash Money. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. I want to give a huge thank you to my panelists, everyone that is here. That goes for Dr. Lakita Bennett Bailey, an associate professor at Georgia State University, Councilman Dupree Kelly, a founding member of Platinum Hip Hop Artist Lords of the Underground, Bangladesh, award winning artist and multi platinum super producer, Dr. A.D. Carson, professor of hip hop and the Global South at the University of Virginia, and Professor Timothy Welbeck, director of the Center for Anti Racism at Temple University. Thank you all all so much for sticking around the whole hour and thank you at home for joining us for turntables to trendsetters our celebration of 50 years of hip-hop i'm jamal andrus peace